Welcome to a special edition of CBS4 News, the murder of Gianni Versace. Now, a look back at the life, legacy, and mystery that surround the death of the fashion icon on his mansion steps. We lost someone who was very dear to us. We lost someone who believed in Miami Beach. He was entering his house. We just heard gunshots when he's on the steps of the house. Is he breathing? Is he breathing? He was a South Beacher. He was a South Beachite. He was part of who we were. He's not moving. He's not moving. He's not moving. Okay. Every single energy force on the beach zeroed in on that house that blood on the steps. There was no room for anything else. It was 25 years ago on the morning of July 15, 1997, that Johnny Versace's personal chef asked that question as he called 911 for help. The answer was uncovered soon enough. On that morning, Andrew Cunanan walked up behind Gianni Versace on these steps in front of the fashion designer's South Beach mansion and shot him twice in the back of the head. Murdered uh, in the heart of South Beach, uh, right there in the middle of Ocean Drive. The execution of Versace and the subsequent manhunt for Cunanan garnered worldwide attention. You just mean it must have been 10, 12 deep. When I walked out, I said, my God, what's going on? But for those of us who lived here and covered the killing, this was a local story, a tale set in a time and a place that attracted both artists and grifters, those who were famous and those who just wanted to be near the famous. Versace didn't create South Beach, but as we noted in this 2017 special for the 20th anniversary of his death, his notoriety turned it into a mecca for all sorts of characters, including Cunanan. His success and, and, and South Beach's success that brought, that brought this guy here. Which is why the Versace murder will always be a South Beach story. Louis Canales, a South Beach pioneer and promoter, recalls the story of how Versace fell in love with South Florida in late 1991. Versace had spent Christmas in Cuba and he was heading back to New York on his way back to Milan. A new Versace store had just opened in Bell Harbor, and he was asked to stop in Miami and make a personal appearance. What greeted him were hundreds of people and dozens of, of bold-faced names, and that took him by surprise. Versace was hooked. In 1992, he spent millions to buy and renovate an Ocean Drive villa, Casa Casarina, rejecting the Art Deco style of the area and instead turning it into a Baroque palace. When Versace arrived in Miami Beach, the wattage just went way up. Tara Solomon was the nightlife columnist for the Miami Herald. He was very hungry for the energy I think that Miami Beach provided. And of course, he loved the you know beautiful environment. He loved all the, the pretty boys and the pretty girls. Miami Beach was a fashion designer's dream. And he really made it so too. Sensual, tropical, hypersexual, energy were the 2,000 models right out of Central Casting populating the beach within that one square mile. He could afford to live anywhere and it was it was kind of interesting that he, he did come here. A reflection of the designer himself, the Versace mansion was loud and over the top and made clear to everyone that this was his town. As Ocean Drive magazine columnist and author Tom Austin told VH1 that year. He's definitely the king of Miami Beach. Even today, Austin seems amazed at the relationship between Versace in South Beach. I mean, he was always kind of a weird fashion character because he's, I mean, he was sort of a joke. At the same time, he was kind of in there too. I mean, a joke that made a lot of money. People made fun of the shirts and how, bra how loud they were and vulgar. It was kind of a shorthand for, like if you were a Coke dealer, you had a Versace shirt. Or... Versace wasn't just a designer. His name had broken through into pop culture, most notably in the 1995 movie Showgirls. Nice dress. Thanks, I bought it at Versace. In the forum? Oh yeah, Versace. I love yeah. Versace. <laughs> Me too. South Beach served as the perfect backdrop for Versace and his brand. Versace was not only a master at his craft, but he was also a genius at self-promotion. 
his effect in South Beach was the same as Brigitte Bardot in Saint-Tropez 50 years ago. He made the destination a globally recognized brand. He created a South Beach collection that included outrageous silk shirts, and along with his sister Donatella, wrote the book South Beach Stories, filled with stunning photos of young people set against the Art Deco architecture. Versace loved being a local, and I think when he came to Miami, he could let his guard down. In this 1994 interview with Charlie Rose, Versace explained why he liked living here. Miami is cool. Miami is uh, a place where you can be yourself without r run. You know, in Milano you have to run every day. Miami is cool. What does I'll, cool mean? Yeah. Cool, simple, beautiful. The weather is fantastic. You don't have really to run in any place. I yeah. wake up and I work. I'm very serene there. Just as he had once drew inspiration from the streetwalkers in Italy, he said he was also inspired by the youthful energy he found in South Beach. You go to Miami Beach, where South Miami is South, South Beach, and, and you to, see what the young people are wearing as they, as they come gliding by in their roller, blade, roller skates. <laughs> I think to be superficial, you yeah. have to be very profound. Though. To be superficial, you have to be profound? Uh, absolutely. It also cannot be understated Versace's place in the gay community. Not only were gays critical in resurrecting South Beach, but it is easy to forget how that community had been decimated by AIDS in the 80s. Just listen to Israel Sands, an early pioneer of Lincoln Road, explain why he opened Flowers and Flowers in the early 90s. I wanted to do a flower shop because uh, I had no good flowers, flower shop to send my mom flowers. All the good florists had died of AIDS. He was an icon in gay life. I mean, there's very few gay, you know, Elton John, you know, Versace, these huge gay icons that, that symbolize having it all. I mean, being gay, openly gay, and then having big houses and fabulous parties. And, you know, he lived large and there's all that, you know, media attention around him. So you could tap into that. Andrew Cunanan wanted that life as well. Born in San Diego, Cunanan was a gigolo who lived off the favors of older men. In the spring of 1997, with his looks fading and his prospects dimming, he set off on what would become a cross-country killing spree. On April 25, 1997, he traveled to Minneapolis, killing an old friend, Jeffrey Trail, beating him to death with a hammer and wrapping his body in a carpet. No one knows where Andrew Kuhnen is right now, and everybody is afraid that he will strike again. Four days later, the body of Cunanan's former lover, David Matson, was found by a lake just outside of Minneapolis. He was lying fought right here. Cunanan used Trail's gun to shoot Matson twice in the head. Cunanan fled in Matson's red Cherokee. Within a week, Cunanan struck again. The nationwide manhunt for Andrew Cunanan moves to the streets of the wealthy Gold Coast along Lake Michigan and Chicago. On May 4th, 1997, Police found the body of a wealthy real estate developer, Lee Miglin. Cunanan had wrapped the 72-year-old in duct tape and stabbed him repeatedly with a screwdriver. Around the corner from Miglin's home, police found that red Jeep Cherokee belonging to David Matson. This guy um, knows we're after him, and uh, he knows he's being sought, and uh, I don't know that he's... I think the end result's going to end up uh, either he's going to commit suicide or he's going to uh, end up in a shootout with the police. Now using Miglin's car, Cunanan drove to Pennsville, New Jersey, where he decided he needed to change vehicles yet again. So on May 9th, he killed William Reese, the groundskeeper of a local cemetery, and took Reese's red pickup truck. The search for Andrew Cunanan continues throughout the East Coast. Friends of his have been notified that he could be in their area. But exactly which city, exactly where, no one knows for sure. Up next, the city where Cunanan would make his last stand, Miami Beach. You know, this is a black eye for us, for, 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 for the city of Miami Beach. That part of the story when we come back to the Versace murder, a South Beach story. Welcome back. Andrew Cunanan arrived in Miami Beach on May 11, 1997. By then, he had already killed four men, Jeffrey Trail, David Matson, Lee Miglin, and William Reese. Driving Reese's red pickup truck, Cunanan checked into what was then the Normandy Plaza Hotel, 
a rundown, low-rent Art Deco-style hotel near 70th Street in Collins, just five miles from South Beach. A far cry from the glamour of the Versace mansion, Cunanan stated room 322, a dingy room in the back of the hotel. As a nationwide manhunt was underway for him, Cunanan lived here for two months, essentially hiding in plain sight, and there were numerous opportunities to catch him. After he was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list in June, FBI agents in South Florida failed to distribute flyers of Cunanan in the gay community. A worker at a Miami subs called police to report Cunanan was there buying a sandwich. Police just missed him. And as he ran low on cash, Cunanan sold a gold coin to a local pawn shop he had stolen from Miglin after killing him. The pawn shop reported Cunanan's name and address at the Normandy Plaza Hotel, but the police never made the connection. Carlos Noriega was the lieutenant over the Miami Beach Homicide Unit in 1997. I think we made mistakes, period. It's just, you know, part of the process. When you have something that significant uh, of that magnitude, uh, you're going to make mistakes. On July 15, 1997, eight days after pawning the coin, Cunanan headed once more to South Beach. On that same morning, Gianni Versace was up early. He had been to the news cafe and at approximately 8.45 in the morning was walking home along Ocean Drive to his villa. Perhaps because of the early hour, there was only one eyewitness to the actual shooting. Marcia Kolokovic provided police a harrowing account of what happened. I saw a man who was coming towards me. I recognized that it was Versace, but I wasn't sure because he was dressed very casual. He saw that I recognized him. He smiled at me. I smiled. At that moment, I saw a person, a guy. I thought it was one of Johnny Versace's admirers or someone who knew him because he sped up to reach Versace. At that moment, I turned around to look at Versace one last time. The guy had already reached Versace on the steps. He pointed his gun with his arm very stretched out as Versace was trying to place his key in the lock. Versace didn't have time to even see or to turn around because it was a matter of seconds. He placed his gun and he fired two shots, one after the other. The murderer came walked backwards from the steps. He placed his gun in the bag, which was open, and he continued on his way down the street as if nothing had happened. Then I looked at Versace. Blood started coming out. How did he get shot there? Oh no, he's walking in front of his home. That's Johnny Versace. He was entering his house. We just heard gunshots we were outside. He's on the steps of the house. I realized it was gonna get uh, really hairy uh, in a lot of ways. The crime scene suggested this wasn't a random shooting. This property receipt shows Versace had more than $1,000 in his pocket, ruling out a robbery. A dead dove was found near Versace's body. One detective told Noriega a dead bird next to a body could be a sign that this was the work of the mafia. And sure enough, the bird was there. There's a, a dead dove there, and it's got a wound to its head, and this may be a mob hit. A bullet passed through Versace, struck the metal gate, splintered, and one of the bullet fragments struck and killed the dove. Talk about bad timing. A sweep of the area turned up a pile of clothes next to a red pickup truck. When the police checked the license plate, they discovered it was stolen from William Reese, Cunanan's fourth victim. Inside the truck, they found documents, including Cunanan's passport and driver's license. The good thing is we knew within a matter of a couple hours that we were looking for Andrew Cunanan. What make this, made this even more surreal at the time was, now we're looking for one of America's 10 most wanted FBI uh, subjects. And, and it just added to um, what was starting to become a pressure cooker for the police department. The Herald called and they said, okay, we've got some news, Versace has been shot and I just, I went numb. It was one of those very sobering moments. You remember where you were, not unlike when Kennedy was shot. Versace was so loved by everyone, and he validated Miami Beach on many levels. We loved Versace, he loved us, and he was on some levels our patron saint. And I think when Versace was killed, there was obviously a loss of innocence. The FBI is actually looking into the possibility now that suspected serial killer Andrew Cunanan may be involved. 
Those flyers that the FBI had failed to pass out before Versace's murder were now everywhere. Be on the lookout for this man, 27-year-old Andrew Cunanan. All of a sudden, we had this sociopath that was on the loose and the gay community was truly concerned. High-profile homosexuals are most at risk. Everyone was worried. There were posters in the, in the clubs. There were flyers everywhere. The whole landscape of Miami Beach changed. You had media trucks lining up Ocean Drive as far as you can see north and as far as you can see south. People were hungry, thirsty for information. Versace's killing the Andrew Cunanan. Or in the death of Gianni Versace. Reporters have flown in from all over the world to cover the murder. Vanity Fair writer Maureen Orth, who had published a lengthy piece on Cunanan, set up residence at the Raleigh, with the hotel's martini bar downstairs turning into a place for reporters to exchange theories. I think we had more international media in Miami Beach at that time than we had ever had before, and it cast a certain shadow over Miami Beach. Small bands of reporters would form their own search parties looking for Cunanan. He was so bland looking kind of that everybody claimed to have saw him or slept with him or whatever. So it was like this tense fever of, you know, like he was there, I was with him, I was at Twist with him. Everybody, everybody saw him at Twist for one thing. And then the night it happened, I took a bunch of journalists to Twist right here. And we were all looking for him. When we come back, the hunt for Andrew Cunanan comes to an end and a 20 year old mystery is solved. So I was a leak. But I felt I was entitled to be a leak. Hello, welcome back. These are pictures from uh, Miami, where the fashion designer Gianni Versace has been shot dead. TV stations around the world broke in with the news of Versace's murder. And within hours, police had identified Andrew Cunanan as the culprit. And then it became, why? why? Why did Cunanan kill Versace? Local, state, and federal agents blanketed Miami Beach. But as the days passed, Noriega began to wonder if Cunanan had slipped out of the city. Cunanan sightings were being reported across the country. But we still had enough information coming out of Miami Beach to, to keep me cautiously optimistic that he was still here. Uh, but I said, I did start having my doubts. On July 23rd, a caretaker was checking on a houseboat at 52nd Street and Collins Avenue when he realized it appeared someone may have been inside. A lot of time, I pulled the gun. Same gun. The same gun. I met caretaker Fernando Carrera in 2017 when he was 91. I give only one step with a gun like that, boom. So I run the railway, my, my wife and my, myself, we run out because we thought somebody shot at me. I see, I don't, I don't see no one, but somebody have a shoot at me. I thought of that. The caretaker fled and called police. Police immediately suspected it was Cunanan inside the houseboat. For hours, they tried to establish contact. They then fired tear gas. And finally, the SWAT team went in. Cunanan was found in the upstairs bedroom with a single shot to the head. Noriega remembers the feeling he had when he went aboard the houseboat to look for himself. I went upstairs, you know, seeing him lying in that bed, you know, it, it was a sigh of relief, really. I took a big sigh of relief and, and, uh, and said, I'm glad it's over. Noriega believes that when Cunanan heard the caretaker enter the houseboat, he feared it was the police and killed himself. It aligns with the profile and his character and personality that he wanted to control everything, including the way that he, he died. Although it was clear to Noriega and others that it was Cunanan, police and federal agents refused to say anything. Former Assistant State Attorney Michael Band wanted Cunanan's identity confirmed through fingerprints. Actually, I made sure there was two examiners Although police refused to release any details that night, that wasn't going to prevent Miami Beach Mayor Seymour Gelber, a former prosecutor and judge. Prior to his death in 2019, Gelber told me he was frustrated throughout the investigation. Police weren't more forthcoming with information, so he admitted taking matters into his own hands. So I was a leak, but I felt I was entitled to be a leak. And, I, and the newspaper guys stopped coming to me for information. And I would 
give it to him if I thought it didn't interfere in a case. And so on the night Cunanan was found on the houseboat, while officials waited until the next day to formally confirm it was Cunanan, Gelber had already given the information to the newspapers and did a phone interview on CNN. I was on the phone all night and Edith was feeding me all kinds of drinks at night to keep me awake because I was calling the West Coast and the South Coast all over. They understood that they could get the information from me and so I gave it all. I felt that this was public information that the press should have. Only after a report in 2017 did some people realize that Gelber was the media source. This is the first I've heard of that. Cy Gelber, the mayor at the time, had everybody's best interest at heart always. Noriega, who would go on to become Miami Beach police chief, says despite the mistakes that were made in the case, he is proud of how the department handled the investigation. His reign of terror stopped here in Miami Beach. Uh, he did not get an opportunity to kill somebody else, go somewhere else, escape, or never be found again. The question of why Cunanan killed Versace remains. Do I feel that somehow their paths crossed at one point? I, I, I believe that's a very strong possibility. Did he want to go out of the picture so that everybody would remember his name? Had he not killed Versace, you wouldn't be here right now. This was his opportunity to create something for himself, a lasting memory, a legacy, if you will, is as reasonable explanation as anything else. Versace's body was cremated and the ashes brought to the mansion in a simple box. Israel Sands, Versace's longtime florist, was waiting for it. Donatella wanted to take the ashes back to Milan and, get, and bring it to her mom. Sands was asked to decorate the box to make it more presentable. We just used the greens from the, from the garden, and then we had some orchids, some cut orchids that we had in water. And then once we got it, we just wrapped it like a birthday present, kind of, and then we stuck in the, the flowers. Sands thinks back on that time and how so much changed on the beach after the murder. We were all young and smart and healthy, and this was kind of like a reality thing, like, you know what, it, this is all gonna end too. You know, you're gonna end too. And I think that that uh, was a, a big growing up thing for everybody in, on South Beach. At Books and Books Cafe on Lincoln Road, Sands and Canales think about the beach today. South Beach, uh, always. Uh, reinvents itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a party destination, it's a party town. So the parties continue, the life continues. It's very materialistic, it's very ostentatious. And superficial. And super, it's always been that way, and that's part of the energy and the charm of it. Yeah. The vulgarity of Miami is so, so strong and so wonderful, and that's what creates the magic of the magic city. Today, the models are gone. Rents on South Beach have skyrocketed and the Versace mansion was sold and is now a tourist hub. Couples take selfie on the steps where Versace was murdered, walking tours, bike tours, and bus tours all included among their stops. I could not be, have imagined it ever become a parody of itself like it has. I mean, there's a restaurant now called Gianni's at the mansion, which I can't even make that up. Like, you know, the levels of bad taste on that. A few years ago, a mini-series on Cunanan and Versace's murder ran on FX. They spent months here shooting, including at the mansion. I'll have a few final thoughts when we return. Johnny Versace and Andrew Cunanan's time on South Beach was relatively short but they will forever be part of our history. We hope you enjoyed this special report. Thank you for watching. I'm Jim DeFiti, CBS News, Miami. Fashion, to me, born and die every day. Why should anybody care about fashion? Even the people who say they don't care, they care, I promise you. Yeah, and why is that? What is it about fashion that makes people care? I mean, is it some... We like to look well, I think. In, into fashion, you can find beauty, quality, uh, life. I think it's some who put color to our life.